fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. And now joining us is the author of uh, a, a newer book. It just came out last year called Malcontent. Lee Harvey Oswald's Confession by Conduct, and this is uh, Sean DeGrilla. Thank you for being here, Sean. Alan, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, Sean, first of all, um, what made you get into uh, writing a book about uh, Lee Harvey Oswald? I know it's a pretty uh, scarce subject, and nobody ever talks about him. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, you're correct on that one. I grew up in Dallas, and, of course, back in the 80s when I was there in the early 90s, it was still a really big deal. And I just became, and I was bitten by the bug. And it's something you just can't get rid of. And as I grew older, I saw the books that were coming out, and I really wanted to you know, tell my side of the story. And especially after I was involved in law enforcement, I can see the patterns that Oswald exhibited. I'm like, I've got to write my book. I have to tell my side of the story. And that's what kind of began that journey. Um, so w- what was your background? Like, what did you do in Dallas? Uh I was a college student. I grew up there. I was moved there when I was 10 and left when I was 20 and moved to uh, Florida. So nothing more, more than being an explorer for the Dallas Police Department and uh, going to school. Hmm. Now, now, the title of the book, Malcontent, uh, where did that come right. from? That's actually from Oswald himself. When he was being interviewed by Fritz, uh, he was asked, in part, what was, uh, what's your opinion of President Kennedy? And part of the was, well, I'm not a malcontent. Well, mm-hmm. nobody asked if you were. You no, know, he volunteered. He wasn't a malcontent when nobody even asked him if he was. So that's just one example, I believe, of the consciousness of guilt that uh, kind of was a self-betraying behavior. So maybe explain that now for listeners. Um, when you say consciousness of guilt and um, your computer voice stress analysis, what, what is that all about? Okay, well, first, consciousness of guilt. Essentially, it's using someone's actions and words to prove their guilt. So, for example, would someone flee the scene? Well, yeah, they might if they're scared, if their shots being fired or something of that nature. But would you flee the scene? Would you change your have, would you have uh, different names? Would you change your appearance? Would you arm yourself? Would you kill a police officer? If it's what we call in law enforcement the totality of the circumstances. It's not just one thing or one or two things. It's the collective, um, it's a collection of all elements to try to prove someone's either guilty or not guilty. And and so uh, now your voice stress analysis, um, how are you, how does that work? How are you figuring that out? Okay. Well, first of all, I am not an expert on the CVSA. Um, when George O'Toole did his assassination tapes book in 75, he took a three-day orientation course and went out and did his own. First of all, I want to make it clear that I'm not an expert in the CVSA. What George O'Toole did in, the, in 75 for his book, Assassination Tapes, is that he took a three-day orientation course in the PSE, and then went at, you know, he became a self-described expert and started doing his own evaluation. What I did was I talked to Jerry Crotty, who's the number two guy... Uh, in CVSA. Number one is Dr. Charles Humble, who reverse engineered the PSE and in the 80s created the computer voice stress analysis. In fact, Jerry Crotty and Dr. Humble worked together. So I got with Jerry and um, I asked him to explain it to me. And in layman's terms, it's kind of like this. The human voice has an AM frequency and an FM frequency. So the AM frequency is the audible. We can hear it. The FM frequency is inaudible. So the CVSA measures when someone is uh, being, when someone has, is showing stress in an answer, the FM frequency will diminish. And the CVSA captures the diminishing of that frequency. That's about the easiest ways I can explain it. 
That's fascinating. It sounds very complicated, but uh, interesting <laughs> that you, you can explain it in, in a way that I can understand anyway, so we're on the right track. Now, you've got several samples of, of this on your website. Um, so, so what did you find from it? Like, what did you find about Lee Harvey Oswald when you, when you uh, picked these samples and listened? Well, first, I want to be objective. So when I told Jerry, I said, Jerry, here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you a one example, and let me know what you find out, right? And so um, I didn't tell him what I should be, what I wanted it to be. I said, run this through your machine. Let me know what you think. So when I write something, especially as a cop, when I was writing arrest reports or, or reports of any nature, how would a defense attorney tear this apart? So a common theme when I was talking about this was that, well, you know, Oswald was nervous when he was arrested, so of course he's going to show stress. So what I did was I went back to New Orleans in his radio interviews three months before Dallas, and he talks a lot about himself, and a lot about himself we already know. We can factually prove it. So, for example, he said, um, are you a Marxist? He says, uh, yes, I'm a Marxist. That showed no deception indicated. Then he was talking about his time in the Marine Corps, and he says he was promoted to the rank of Buck Sergeant. And there was extreme stress on Buck Sergeant because you all know he was only a PFC. And in fact, when he was discharged from the Marine Corps, he was only a private. So I wanted to make sure I had that metric by which we can say, okay, everything so far is true. Whatever Oswald lied about, we can prove it. And then when he was telling the truth, we can prove that as well. Mm. So... Before before we get into what you thought the results were, uh, right. tell, tell us what you thought about the JFK assassination before you got into this and before sure. you brought this evidence forward. What was your thinking or belief on what happened? I always believed there was a conspiracy when I went up. Uh, when I was younger, my first book was Cover Up by Jerry Gary Shaw. They sold it at the uh, Dallas Trademark. My dad used to go to gun shows all the time down there. So that was my first uh, introduction into the assassination. So I wrote to Penn Jones Jr., and that began uh, years of correspondence with Penn Jones. He'd give me pictures and magazines, and of course he believed that the military-industrial complex was involved in the assassination. I was really young and impressionable back then, and you know I met Ed Hoffman and other people who claimed new witnesses, and so I was just immersed in that conspiracy culture that was in Dallas. Not until I kind of moved away from that when I moved to the Orlando area, and then actually when I became a cop, kind of you know, began to think for myself and see things differently. And that's when I slowly turned the tide towards from conspiracy to, yeah, Oswald's the one that did it. Right. Um, well, um, so do you think Oswald was um, backed by others or part of things that maybe um, knew what he was going to do? Or do you think he was just kind of a lone guy? There? Well, here's the thing. You can never close the door on conspiracy, right? So even though I believe Oswald did it, is it possible that maybe when he went to Mexico City, maybe he was egged on by some you know, uh, Cubans? I mean, I, you, you just don't, you'll never know. I don't see any hardcore proof of any of that. But I hate, I, know, I never say never because you, you, know, you just never know. But I've, I've, to me, I haven't seen any credible evidence of that, like hardcore, reliable, credible evidence. But that's always the possibility, and that possibility is very, very tantalizing. Well, if it's on Facebook, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, that, there you go. It's a conspiracy. Well, it that's, uh, you know. Uh, so, now, what, what did this, this analysis um, show you? Like, what did you get out of this? Well, it showed me, it actually proved, basically, Lee Harvey Oswald was taking a lie detector test and didn't even know it. It's amazing the things we found out. We found out, let's go back to New Orleans, that he was a Marxist. He believed. He believed in the Marxist principles, the economic theories, and all that. And so that's true. Uh, he, the one interesting graph that came back, and by the way, I included all my graphs. I didn't delete any. I didn't say, oh, I don't like this one. Everything Jerry Crotty generated for me is in my book. He did talk about the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And they asked him, how many members do you have? He said, well, we've had area, uh, members in this area for several months now. But we do know that Oswald was the only member as far as we can tell. I don't see any evidence of any other members, so that one came back that he was telling the truth. So I said, Jerry, how do you reconcile this? There are really no known members of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And he said, 
if somebody really truly believes it, they can beat it. So either there are other members that we don't know about, or he really believed in what he was saying. So it showed to me that showed how much of a fantasy world he was living in, because he believed there are other members. He believed so much in this, you know, self-made uh, fair play for Cuba committee group that he started to believe his own delusion. But to me, that was very, very telling. So with that, um, when he claimed he was a patsy, you know, right. did you test that? And what did you oh, think of that vocal? I did. Well, there's two things to that. First of all, many authors say they quote, I'm just a patsy, but they don't quote the entire thing. What he was saying was um, they have taken me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. So that is, he's not saying he's a patsy being framed for the assassination. You know, the, the United States was in the throes of the Cold War at that time, and he was the Iron Curtain. Somebody from the military today, you know, defecting to ISIS, going over to Afghanistan or Iraq. So he was saying he was a pawn. He was, the, he was a patsy because he had lived in the United States. And, of course, um, relations were very, very uh, tense between the two superpowers. So that's what he was doing. And when it showed, when I ran, well, when Jerry ran, the results through the, the machine, it's showing that he was deceptive. Yeah, there's more to it than, than meets the eye. Um, so w what kind of um, feedback are you getting from the JFK conspiracy community now? Well, it's, you know, it's basically <laughs> it's down party lines, right? I, try, I reached out to uh, JFK Lancer, which is the group that publishes books in Dallas and one time had the conferences, and they refused to publish it. I reached out and said, hey, would you, I kind of want to bridge the gap between the two communities. That's exactly what I said. I want to extend the olive branch, which is what I said. And I was refused. But basically, um, I stopped believing in a lone gunman a long time ago. So they refused. Uh, it really goes down party lines. People say, oh, the CVSA is junk. Well, you know, I do have studies on my website, the legal cases that now um, is allowed in certain jurisdictions. So... I say people do their own research. I will tell you that, you no, know, Oswald lied and told the truth um, in the same sentence. He was asked, uh, Mr. Oswald, how'd you hurt your eye? He leans forward and says, a policeman hit me. Well, that is true. Earlier, he uh, was saying that, um, did you shoot the president? He goes, oh, did you kill the president? He says, no, I have not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. So, no. Hard, um, hard block stress. I have not, no stress, because he was not charged with killing Kennedy, as you all know, until after that press conference. So he was lying when he said, no, I didn't kill the president. I have not been charged with that, was truthful, because he indeed had not been charged with that. So, uh, like I said, all my charts are in there. I found nothing that showed any inkling of conspiracy or innocence. Everything that I have seen and this uh, test points towards his guilt. Wow. So um, what, what, was, what were the other things that you've learned about uh, Oswald that you didn't know before? Well, the more I, I studied him, the more I came to understand him. And, you know, it, it's hard. Obviously, he's dead. He, you know, it's really hard to really under, truly understand somebody. But he, he became really, really scary. He, I know you've written some books, Al, about... Um, serial killers. Now, I'm not oh. sure what. I'm, I'm not sure. Look at actually the covers anyway look amazing. I don't know what the, what the threshold is, but to me, it's almost as if he enjoyed killing people. He enjoyed stalking people. Uh, General Walker, he shot at and almost killed General Walker. He stalked him. He fought. About it. He planned it out. Um, it's almost like he enjoyed it. And you know when he killed Officer Tippett within a wink of an eye, within a few seconds he knew. That he was going to kill him. And then he, he came back around and put a final round in Tippett's head just to make sure he was dead. And then he had no qualms about pulling out his pistol and almost doing a suicide by cop scenario and trying to pull the trigger and kill more officers. So it really surprised me how willing he was to kill people. It just it was shocking. Do you think that was like a mental illness that was getting out of hand, or do you think he'd sort of been killing for quite a while? Maybe well, we just didn't know it. There's no evidence he's been, you know, I'm not a psychologist. 
or psychologist. So, but I have been talking to one in Miami, a very renowned um, psychologist in Miami, for my next book, and I definitely think that there was, you know, you know he was not wound too tight. Absolutely, he freely and he, he enjoyed doing it. And you know, his baby, you know, his his baby would sleep in, in the bottom dresser door, and he was out there, you know, buying these weapons and these periodicals and stuff like that. Not think of his family. He was out there. It was a little fantasy world. So I do believe that. However, I'm not qualified to give, uh, you know, a, a definite answer on that one. But anybody who can kill that easily and that freely for nothing, you know, it's just to me that screams some sort of mental illness. So what do you do? Do you think he was Judith Ferry Baker? Do you think she was no. really having an affair with him, and that was real? Uh, I got to be careful what I say. I was. My opinion <laughs> is absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. My opinion is absolutely not. You know what? Um, Walt Brown, who's a conspiracy writer, he wrote a book. I don't have it yet. Uh, about Judith Baker, seeing all the inconsistencies and in that. From what I read recently, um, she said that. If I recall correctly, during his breaks at the Uriah Coffee Company, he would go with David Ferry and grind up mice for her experiments. And that, if I recall correctly, that Jack Rudy was Lee Harvey Oswald's father. So if that is correct, if those quotations are correct, I mean, it's just nonsense. Any, I think what happened... I was going to say, I've interviewed her twice, and, and she... Uh... Yeah, she thinks Jack Ruby was uh, no, just as uh, they used to take him to parties, um, and he was. She said she met him as Sparky Rubenstein, not Jack Ruby. Uh, yeah, and that um, you know, so she has a totally. Uh, yeah, I'm sort of. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of not really buying a lot of it either. But I was just wondering if well, you think he was the type to have an affair like. Well, that's that. the thing is, no, nobody liked him. I mean, he's almost asexual anyway. There was a time when even Marina and. You know, you got to take her testimony with a grain of salt. But even she would say he stopped brushing his teeth. He stopped taking showers. He would have, you know, relations maybe once a month. You know, and she would, she would receive no satisfaction from it. Nobody liked him. He couldn't hold a job more than three months. He, his marriage was failing. There's absolutely zero evidence in my mind that who would want to hang out with him? No one wanted to. Once they got to know him, they didn't like him. Except for... You know, you have Georgia Morris Shelton and a few select others, uh, but that's it. So I think it's totally out of his character. I think those of us who studied him enough believe that that's incorrect. And when you have hardcore conspiracy authors saying, nope, it didn't happen, I mean, what does that tell you? Yeah. So what do you, what do you think the big draw is for all of these people to write and to really believe it um, that – you know, he wasn't the lone gunman and, right. and uh, the whole thing. Do you think it's just that they, is it that we as a people do not want to believe that some nutball like him would could shoot the president? I think there's some of that. I think people love a conspiracy. I hate to say it. It's kind of like it's romantic in a way. And I was like, oh, the killers are still out there. and some big conspiracy. And, you know, it is waiting to be discovered. And a lot of it is Google research. People you know, go down to Dallas, interview the witnesses. Um do your own research. Use primary source material. I see that you have a bachelor's in criminology. Is that, is that correct? I have one in history. You know, we use primary source material. You know, you know, yeah. I don't. Well, those days are gone. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> those You're days right. are gone. I mean, I mean, they're, everybody uh, in these groups, most of them are obsessed with uh, what that. they can find off the Internet, and that's it. They're not going meeting people and, and finding out things firsthand. So. Sure. Uh, but. But 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 uh, the reason I stick with this is because um, a lot of the JFK authors and stuff people were back before the internet day, so they actually were more in, involved in this somewhat. Right. Um, so that's why I ask if sure. you know what do you think their draw is on it? Well, there, you know, there's some things that only the people who do them understand. So was it you know for this plane? What, what what was what was his deal? I think you know. He was a defense attorney, and he saw an opening to be to get in there. And, I, and he, you know, he rushed to judgment was full. It's fraught with error, with errors, and uh, so there's that kind of publicity. There's you know you talk about Judith Baker. That's you know she has her own. Uh, you know, not going to yeah. go into that. No, no, Judith Baker and Roger Stone and that whole. Oh thing, my goodness! They're 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 just looking to sell. You know, and that's fine. You know, that's what right. they do. Um, 
Um, but you know, there was a, there was a few good pieces out there. I just not, I just yeah, I just I I don't see it as um, such a big draw. What do you did you go through the Warren report and what's your opinion on it? Well, I do have the volumes, all the, all twenty six volumes under report. I read the report. I've gone through the volume for my research. You know, it's not perfect. Nothing was perfect. Yes, they got it out before the election. Absolutely, and things are left out. Now to say then that the Men would jeopardize their careers, their education, their freedom, just to um, perpetuate a cover-up is absurd. So, I mean, that means all the politicians, the police, the law enforcement, you know, doctors, uh, those in the media were trying to continue this cover-up. You know, you're divorced from reality, if that's your belief. You can believe it, and that's great, but you have to come back to reality if those things don't happen. This type of conspiracy, quote-unquote conspiracy, has not existed before or since the Kennedy assassination. So um, people just have to kind of step back a little bit, take a breath. Okay, does this sound reasonable? I was, just, so, saying, I was just saying to Alan when we lost you uh, how, how interesting this is, but I am one of those ones who uh, am on that side of the fence, and I really do believe that Oswald acted alone. Um, I, I myself, I'm a podcaster, so I'm one of the one of the okay. people who are the problem that Alan's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're but, the one. Yeah, I'm uh, one of them. Yeah, he's the one. But uh, he did I did go to Dallas, and I went to the sixth floor, and I, I did my own sort of, I spent a lot of time there and a lot of time thinking about what I was seeing, went outside, all those right. kind of things. And over the years, I've heard a lot of talk about the space and how nobody could have made these shots with uh, um, with that as, as fast as the car was going and the amount of space that it was. But it's a lot smaller in person than what you see on television. And I felt I mean, I'm an ab- amateur target shooter, and I felt well. I, I I don't want to say that I would do something like this, but I think I could have made those shots personally. Well, it's funny you say that. I took my son Gibson. He was 11 at the time. Went to Dealey Plaza. Went to the book depository, and he looked and uh, he looked down. And he goes, "Daddy, that's a really easy shot." You know, and it, it is. It's, 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 you know, it looks so expansive when you see it in pictures and that kind of stuff. When you get there, it's really really tiny. Yeah. And. You know, you know, if you're going to have a gunman behind the concrete wall there in front of the fence, they're going to see you. They're going to hear you, right? You're, you're going to see it. And once you get there and look around, it's like, yeah, that's not reasonable. You know, what's what's the most reasonable? Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so easy. Yeah, I think it's easy. And think of it this and, way. Oswald was trained to shoot at 500 yards mm-hmm. using a rifle with iron sights only. 500 yards. His final shot was about 88 yards. Yeah. Using... Well, presumably his telescopic sight, we don't know if he transitioned from his iron sights to his telescopic sights or vice versa, we don't know. But he only shot a fifth of what he was trained to shoot in Marine Corps. So it's a very, very easy shot, especially for him, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just, but, you know, people um, people can be real... Um, easy to persuade into things. I mean, I, I, just Howard Stern has the man on the street um, right. what, yesterday, and they were, t- they were telling people that uh, new JFK uh, papers had come out. Have you heard about that? And everyone says, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I did. And they say, so now it says that Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe killed JFK. What do you think of that? <laughs> oh, I could believe it. I could believe it. Oh, boy. And, you know, you kind of have to shake your head. Like, what? You, you can't be serious. But, you know, she was dead. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> well, was she? I don't know now. Now you got me wondering about yeah. you know, looking at this one. Yeah, you know? she's, she's really She made the sound <laughs> before she did there, it. Yeah. There it is. There it is. But listen, you know, like I said, I don't want to shut the door on conspiracy at all. No. Um, and But no. I don't see it. Any, no. I need, you know, in law enforcement, we, we deal in facts, not speculation. And I don't see anything. And there's, there's no secret, especially nowadays, that you can keep from from anybody. You know, a jealous lover. You know, if someone gets pinched for a crime. They you know they turn and they, they become an informant for you, and they spill the beans. So it can be any number of things. And do you think if there was conspiracy, to keep any documentation as such to be found out? Absolutely not. No. So uh, now, yeah. So even the premise of that is just absurd. But yeah. yeah. 
No, I agree with that. Um, so now you're going to do two more books um, on the same subject. Like, wh what are you going to cover with your next books? Like, how is this tied? Well, I'm doing the next one I'm doing right now is about his radicalization, and I I barely scratch the surface on it. So uh, it's basically I'm taking the post 9/11 radicalization elements that uh, the Department of Homeland Security has and that kind of thing. So what do people do when they radicalize? they distance themselves from their family. They usually leave the country and go to um, go to a foreign country. They adopt some sort of radical um, ideology. They start writing um, they start writing these um, radical texts. That's everything Lee Harvey Oswald did. He tried to renounce the citizenship, that kind of thing. So and then when he comes back to the United States, what does he do? He gets with the, you know, communist and socialist literature, these organizations. And then just the General Walker attempt is a big one because he, he crossed over that bright line from normal person, so to speak, to a killer. He made that decision to kill somebody. And once you cross that line, there's no going back. So that's what, that's what I'm doing now. It's, it's, you know, I, like I said, I just started it, but that's the route I'm taking. Okay. Well, uh, let's give out what, what is your website so people can find you? Uh, it's SeanDegrilla.com. That's easy. It is. And, and of course, your <laughs> book is out in Amazon, and we're going to have all that linked up as well so people can um, do one click and buy the book. Uh, I appreciate and, it. And uh, go to your site and all that sort of stuff, so that's important. Um, wow. So um, it's been very interesting. Um, uh, so the book is called Malcontent and Lee Harvey Oswald's Confession by Conduct. Sean DeGrilla is the guest and the author. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And on the website, you can click to email me. And anybody has any questions, any comments, please email me, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. I look forward to hearing what people have to say. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.